Sanders. And the very first guy I thought of to do this was this man right here, Mike Shy. I'm going to read, I haven't read anyone's bio yet, but I'm going to read Mike's. He's a PGA, PGA member for 25 years, NorCal PGA. He's driven down here last night late, or the well, day before, last night late, yesterday. The owner and director of the Instruction of Instruction Performance Golf Institute at Dragonfly Golf Club for the last 12 years. He's taught numerous nationally ranked juniors. He's an vector putting instructor. He works with several PGA Tour players and their caddies. He's the instructor and coach to the 2015 NCAA and U.S. Amateur Champion, Bryson DeChambeau. <laughs> now, I invited Mike before Bryson won those because I knew how special and different Bryson was. There's quite a bit more. He started the 40 Days to Better Golf program. And he's been fortunate to be a part of incredible young men and women's lives and has influenced them to strive for excellence in every aspect of their lives. And that's what he's going to do here with us today. Everyone welcome Mike Shy. Well, thank you. So we're going to try to make this as informal as uh, possible because this is the golf swing that just doesn't work. And so a lot of people have a lot of questions. Everywhere we go, whether it's Bryson uh, and I together, or if I'm by myself and golf pros are around, there are a lot of questions. So we'll, Billy's gonna help me a little bit. He's gonna ask me some questions. We're gonna talk a little bit. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of how this happened uh, and why it happened. And uh, again, I, I'm, first of all, I'm honored to be here because we are all teaching golf professionals. We're trying to make the game better. We're trying to make our students better. We're trying to help them enjoy the game. And so I don't presume to know any more than you guys. Uh, I've been doing this now for well, 30 years. Uh, as a PGA member, just celebrated uh, 25 years this year. And uh, I'm just trying to make it better. And I'm fortunate now, I primarily just teach juniors and amateurs. Uh, I do have a few pros that come in every once in a while uh, and a couple of caddies. Uh, uh, we're very fortunate to work with uh, Ricky Fowler's caddy for a while, and that was kind of fun, and we've become really good friends, uh, and so on. So again, my goal is to, first of all, Bryson DeChambeau is a great young man, and that's the most important thing to me, that these kids, they're all high achievers, they're good kids, they do things in their community, they give back, and every once in a while they do something very, very special, like win the NCAA and the uh, uh, U.S. Amateur Championship. So, uh, where do we start? I think normally everybody asks about the clubs first, and we can start with that a little bit. So, uh, has everybody heard of Bryson DeChambeau? I'm assuming most of you have heard him. Has any, who watched the U.S. Amateur? Did you guys watch the U.S. Amateur when he fired me, according to, <laughs> that's why we got in a fight on number seven or something, something happened like that. Uh, I've worked with Bryson since he was 11 years old. Uh, he actually came to me one day and said, I want you to be my coach. At that time, his dad was teaching him. I said, you need to go back to your dad, have a conversation with him, and let him know that he's no longer your teacher or coach, that, that I'm going to be your teacher and coach. And he did. Like you said, he was like 11 years old, came back the next day or a couple days later and said, all right, we're in. We're going to go. We're going to do this together. Uh, my facility, uh, what I do, I don't really do half-hour lessons or hour lessons. He averaged, I would say, at least 20 hours a week with me from the time he was 11 until he left for uh, SMU. And that's the way it is with all my students. I don't, here's an 11 o'clock time, I don't do that. I have more of an academy or golf school environment. Uh, you'll see in a video, kids come in, I have a 1,600 square foot tent. Uh, we just found it was too expensive to build a building, so we had a tent instead. Uh, it's been knocked down by wind and we rebuilt it. Uh, the kids just love to come in and hang out. And we do have adults, by the way, that like to come in too because they feel a lot younger when they hang out with us. So uh, we do allow them to, to show up every once in a while. Uh, so what happened? Let's see. He came to me, uh, let's see, right before Aaron Hills and asked, why do I have to play variable length golf clubs? Has any student ever asked you that before? <laughs> what would you tell them? Right? It's an easy question to ask and a very, very difficult question to answer. Those of us who've been around for a while, we saw the failure of Tommy Armour. Did we not? The equalizer? Anybody ever hit the equalizer? No. DQL, whatever? Yeah, right. So, 
not a very good golf club. Uh, we all, I'm sure, tried it. Tommy Armour had a very good club at the time and then basically bankrupt themselves by going to the same like golf club. So again, I knew that and that scared me a little bit when he actually asked that question. What was fun though is that um, his mind, the way he thinks, I've never, ever, ever said no to Bryson DeChambeau. If he wanted to try something, I said, let's go, let's try it. Even though it might cost him a golf tournament, because he would win a lot of junior golf tournaments, but he cost himself a lot of junior tournaments as well because he wanted to try something. He wanted to experiment with something. And so at, the, at Aaron Hills, he asked me that question, we went, came back home and we started tearing golf clubs apart. And the first set, which I have a couple of them here, and I thought I'd pass them around. You can kind of see uh, some things that we did. A lot of you, and again, I'm a Nike guy, and so I'll make fun of Nike just for a minute. So some people would say this would have made this club better um, at the time. Good, <laughs> you get that joke, that's all right. And so uh, this is a combo set. And if you leave, let's see, Bryson was 17 at the time, and you leave a 17-year-old alone at a grinder, this is the club that shows up later. And so uh, these were 37 and a half inches long. Uh, we did a sand or a 60 degree all the way through a three iron. And uh, we made all the heads at 285 at that time. And uh, what I did is I put a six iron dynamic gold shaft in, this is the SL shaft in this one. Um, and he went out, played with them, won a junior tournament like a week or two later, said, I really like this, now what do we do? And so I was going to pass this around, you guys want to just kind of check those out. Nothing special, just kind of a fun history and story. Uh, after that, uh, we went down, uh, let's see, he had been playing some tailor-made clubs, and uh, this is kind of a funny story. And, and so, and again, the Nike were, were the experiment. Tim Hewitt at the uh, Kingdom is a good friend, and he said, hey, I kind of like what you guys are doing, and I'll send you some throwaway heads, and he had the CB heads. And uh, he sent me heads, long irons that were too heavy and short irons that were too light. And we put them together, and again, Bryson liked them and, and uh, played with those. We went down to the kingdom. All the fitters had heard about Bryson. His dad went with us. His dad was bent on us. At that time, we were going to go back to variable length clubs, as a parent would probably get involved at that point. So what happened was they got his golf clubs, spread them all out. I mean, all over the, they had them all on the range, all on the ground. They were laughing at him. They were telling us this doesn't work, can't work, will never work, it's been done, so on. So the thing that I asked them to do, I said, before we move any further, I want you to watch Bryson hit his sand wedge to the three iron. And he's going to hit every club at, a, at his club head speed at 90 miles an hour, from sand wedge or 60 degree all the way to three iron. And he's going to have 15 yard exact increments between each club. No way. I said, Put one track man, let's just do it. So anyway, they did it, he did it. Uh, Brad, I can't remember the guy's name, who's one of the top fitters there, he said, I fit every tour pro that we have on staff and I've never seen anybody do that, ever. So we're in, we wanna build them a set. About 45 minutes later, they came back with a set of golf clubs Again, we had to grind some of the short irons and had to add lead tape, so the integrity of the club was still a little bit off. Bryson did very well. He performed fairly well at a couple of USAMs. Um, at one point, let's see, this was going into last year, Bryson had a 60% chance of finishing the top five of every golf tournament he played in. That is unheard of. During this process, we figured, well, we need somebody to actually build a club from scratch, in other words, from a block of metal. And that's where uh, David Adele came into play, who owns Adele Golf. He's uh, primarily known for his putters and uh, wedges. And he's an artist, does watches, uh, and so on. So just a great guy, very, very good friend, loves the game, PGA member, and a good friend of Bryson's as well. And he started making Bryson's golf clubs. So if you look at those Nike clubs, I think those, the lingles on those, on those clubs were right around 65 degrees. The club I'm gonna pass you around now, which is uh, basically a copy of what Bryson is using uh, right now. This is a 72 degree, full seven iron. And 
is it worth knowing? That's yeah. about between six and seven iron, and that's about four degrees upright. Yeah. Sixty-one ish is the number. Yeah. Yeah. Six one sixty-two. So four degrees upright. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So these are seventy-two, so it'd be classified as a ten-degree upright golf club. Okay. Doesn't work. Looks pretty good though, doesn't it? Does it look okay? You guys okay with that swing? Yeah. How tall is How tall is Bryson? About six feet tall. Not a big okay. guy. He's yeah. got kind of long arms for six feet. Yeah. But. So, and what's fun about Bryson, and this has taken us just, and again, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, he's a lot of fun to teach and to hang out with and, and so on. And I've been on the injured list as well. I had a very, very difficult, crazy year this last year. I had uh, two of my children get married. Uh, in between those weddings, my mom passed away. The next weekend, he won the NC2A. A week and a half or two weeks later, I caddied for him, or I made it one round uh, at the St. Jude. I got injured. And then um, uh, I decided, because I had caddied for one of my students at Olympia Fields, that I think I could make it pushing the rickshaw, which wasn't a pretty sight. In fact, the week after it was over, he looked at me and he said, so you walked 90 miles. How did that happen? Because he knew that my feet were in terrible shape. And at the on Saturday or Sunday, I developed a blister on the bottom of my right foot that was two inches by two inches in diameter. So try walking on that all week. That was a lot of fun as well. So it was def definitely a labor of love, as you guys would probably do the same things for your student. I love him. He's like my son. My daughter calls him the other brother. Uh, and it's really kind of fun to watch her beat him up quite a bit. It, it's just a great relationship. My family has bought into what I did. I could not do what I do without my family and their support. Um, because of what we do, my phone is, is literally available 24-7. Bryson calls me after every round of golf. So do most of my other students as well. They want to go through their rounds. They want to go through where they failed in not doing the process. I love that term. Okay, we talk a lot about how we do a process. Step A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, whatever that might be, are you doing your work when you're playing? <coughs> the other thing that we've tried to do, one of our goals right now, we're trying to take the word feel out of our conversation as well. We can talk about that a little bit later as well. And so again, my goal and the student's goal is to just to do their work. Trust what they do, do their work. All the results, all that will happen, okay? So, this club, I'm going to send this around. Uh, again, uh, I did an interview with uh, PGA Tour um, Radio, and for some reason, their first question to me was, why doesn't Bryson hit a 60 degree 160 yards? Because it's the same length of the set there. Okay? So, um, everybody knows why? Okay. All right. So me being kind of a smart aleck at that point, because I couldn't believe that was the first question, I started getting into the aerodynamics of a golf club and that a uh, 60 degree has more drag than a 30 degree. And so and they really liked that conversation again. Okay, he just, it, it does what it does. Right, it's got loft, you know, so anyway. But that was the PGA Tour radio. So uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll go over some of his uh, thoughts and what he does. I don't teach this to everybody. I have about four students that are using same only clubs. Uh, I did have a student or do have a student who's only been playing golf for about four years. Uh, she just got a full ride scholarship to Kansas State. And uh, let's see, she, we got her a same length set of golf clubs within a, a year and a half of that. Starting, she qualified for the U.S. girls proceeded to hit uh, 15 greens and 16 greens uh, in Arizona at Forest Meadows. Um, she's this, I love this girl, she's such a good kid. We're on the range, she's crying because she's never been in that environment before. I mean, bawling, literally bawling. What do I do, what do I do? I can't hit my five iron, why can't I hit my five iron? I look at her and I go, well, Hayden, it's the same as your eight iron. And she looked at me and she said, oh yeah, that's right. Just started nailing. You know, again, it's just the little things that seem to work every once in a while. Uh, I get, I'm a big believer that I, I really think that same like golf clubs, especially in the irons and possibly hybrids, could help us in developing golfers. Again, I've taught for 30 years, give the student, new student, an eight iron or seven iron or whatever it might be. You teach them and they go, what about all these other clubs? They go to their five iron or whatever and they can't hit it. 
That seems to not happen when you're using the same length set of golf club. We see them, it's much easier to hit, it's much easier to go from swing to swing. Uh, there's not a lot of thought uh, that goes with it. It is a bit difficult in the process to build, but we're doing some things right now because of what's happened. and The industry is a little bit excited about what we're doing, um, where we might see some same length sets uh, come out here soon. Uh, let's see, what else? Well, I got a question. Yeah. Who here thinks that it's actually a pretty smart idea to do that? I, mostly good players and good teachers I've asked a lot lately and they think, yeah, that's a great idea. So back to you, more hands are popping up. Okay. No, the rest never considered it, doesn't seem right. Be, you know, don't be ashamed, yeah. Would, in your head, and this is what my dad said, I told my dad about this set of clubs, he goes, imagine how good he'd be if he used regular clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone think that? Yeah. And by the way, his, his variable length set that he started with at 15, he was five degrees flat on those when he started. And he was a good little player. He had uh, 15, I think he finished top five junior world, so he's, he's been a good player. Uh, as you can see, there are big grips on the clubs as well. Uh, we partnered with a company called Jumbo Max, a small company out of Florida. Great bunch of guys. You've probably seen the guy who wears the dress in the Golf Channel commercial. Um, and one of the things that we were doing, this was about the State Am five, four years ago, uh, and Bryson had a normal grip on his golf club. And he was gripping it somewhat in the fingers, but he wanted to grip it more in the lifeline. And one of the problems that was happening was because of how he throws the golf club, he had some wrist issues. And as soon as we put the big grip on, he could grip it in his lifeline. It was no problem to hold on to. Any, all that pain went away uh, virtually instantly, which was really kind of cool. Uh, it's a pretty big grip, as you'll see. Uh, the, the grips weigh about 120 grams. Uh, the typical, his golf clubs weigh 500, right now 516 grams, every club. I mean, right on 516, uh, 517 and 516, because if you gave him a 517, he will go insane because that's the way he thinks. Again, physics guy, somewhat of a, of a perfectionist. Uh, that's why when I drew that line, at impact, he typically, he's always had fairly high hands at impact. He just said, well, why, shouldn't, why don't I start there? And so that's kind of the direction that we went. It just made sense to him. He didn't like the idea of the club elevating to another plane line. He just wanted to keep his hands in the club on one plane. It just, to him and his brain, it just made sense and thought it would be easier. Not necessarily the easiest swing to do, but it was very efficient. Would you say Mo Norman had something to do with that? Yeah, I, we talked about Mo. I was a Ben Doyle guy, um, a golfing machiner growing up, and Ben would always show us Mo Norman, so I knew about Mo. And obviously on YouTube, you can see lots of Mo. Uh, he kind of liked Mo. Every once in a while, somebody thinks that he's like Mo, and that he's not autistic in any way. He's just very, very bright, um, and he's actually very personal. I don't know if you've seen him on interviews. He's, he's great to talk to. Um, but yes, that was that was definitely one that he looked at. He even tried to mimic it. Well, he can mimic his swing. He can almost mimic anybody's swing. He mimics Hogan's swing really well, um, and so on. But he just felt. We just did it a little bit differently. He's much more rotational. There is no weight shift in his golf swing. He keeps all his weight. We've had him on body track. I have weight boards. Uh, his weight virtually stays perfectly center. Um, so you can say it's a center pivot or whatever you might do. He tries to keep it all over his left hip joint and rotates around that. So that would be his uh, axis point and how he swings. He doesn't have what he would say, like most of us would say, let's try to maintain angle. He actually throws the club from his shoulder. He wants the club releasing as soon as possible from the top of the swing. And you'll see, uh, we'll do uh, face on. But you keep this in mind, both Mike. Yep. Mike has a strong background in the golfing machine, as some of you know. And that mostly golfing machine that's used Ben Hogan as a model who had quite a bit of lag. So everyone thinks, oh, golfing machine, tons of lag. But again, it's another way one of the patterns available, and you'll watch this lack of narrowness, extreme amount of width. One of, one of the things that when I asked, when somebody asked me a question, I thought Homer answered most questions, I thought really well, it depends. I try not to give an immediate answer. My first answer is always, is it, it depends. 
And so when he started working on this and trying, and again, one of the things that I try to do with my students is I want them to own what they do. Like, again, I, it was yesterday, a, a Jamie talking about Furyk. I, I mean, is anybody teaching Jim Furyk's golf swing right now? I thought he hit it pretty good. I'm trying to figure out why we don't teach that golf swing. And so um, I keep waiting for his dad to come out with a book and so on, so it'd be kind of fun to read. Because again, there's one of the best ball strikers in the world who's done pretty well making a living, um, and he's, he's, again, he's a great ball striker, and yet we're not teaching that. Why? Because it doesn't look right. You know, and so same thing with this is that it doesn't look right, although it's really funny watching golf pros get mesmerized watching them hit golf balls. And so uh, whether it's face on or down line, it's, it's always, now this was at the Walker Cup, and uh, it was a little bit windy, so he was hitting a low shot there. Uh, he did had a great week. Other he got hurt a little bit in his neck. We've discovered that that is in his back swing, the shoulder was kind of scrunching a little bit. So we've tried to get rid of that. That's what he's working on right now. Um, you might know that he's withdrawn from SMU. SMU ran into some problems, uh, so they're not able to uh, participate in any postseason. He's withdrawn from SMU. He's uh, probably going to turn golf pro after uh, Augusta, and um, he's on his way to Argentina, he's going to play in the Argentine Open, uh, come back home, we've got some work to do till the end of November, and then he's going to go to the Australian Open, uh, and then try to Monday qualify a few again. As an amateur, as you know, you can't. he's only going to get seven starts, so if he actually took those starts uh, as an amateur, that he wouldn't get them when he turns pro. And as you know, the FedEx points and money are pretty important uh, to get full status. And so that's, at this point, that seems to be our plan. He is going to finish his degree. Uh, again, he's a physics major. Uh, one, one of the things that is amazing about him, uh, I would get phone calls at midnight, um, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock his time. He'd be leaving a library. Uh, had just met with his tutor who was going over quantum physics or quantum mechanics. And uh, of course, he just needed somebody to talk to on the way home so he wouldn't fall asleep. But he worked so hard uh, at maintaining uh, his grades. Because I'm telling you, a physics major is not easy. And so had he gone to the spring and tried to graduate this spring, he would have had to actually take time off from golf. Uh, he had labs and things that were mandatory that just, you can't play golf. And they had told him that if you're gonna to try to graduate in the spring, it's just not, that's not gonna work. So he's gonna take his time over the next year and a half and, and try to get all that done. Uh, he's very committed to that too. He wants that physics degree, that's for sure. He's worked very hard to try to get that. I helped him out a little bit. I knew that, yeah, I knew that, so, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, as a coach, for you, you had to deal with Bryson, who was kind of like a new student for you that he had had these ideas in his head that you were there to support him no matter what. So as a coach, were you ever there to, any questions that were running through your head or that you were just, were you there full support no matter what he said? You were like, okay, I'm 100% behind you. Like in your mind from back then to now. Uh, no, there were definitely questions. And, and the other thing too is that we knew as a coach and him doing what he was going to do, he was, we got made fun of like you can't imagine. His coach, assistant coach at the time when he was a freshman, took him over to Hunter Mann. Hunter told him this is never going to work. You're not going to be very good. That wasn't a very good prediction. Um, it, it nonstop. And so it had to be very supportive. Again, he had to own, going back to the cure and him, let's, if you're going to do this, you've got to own it. It's got to be 100% yours. You've got to be able to defend what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. One of the benefits for him, again, being so smart, if you question him about anything that he's doing, get ready for a pretty good argument. You know, to defend. He'll be respectful, but he'll defend it the whole way. So from my perspective, again, it was supporting him, uh, being that sounding board, eyes. Uh, I tend to not, he gets mad. We, we fight pretty well because um, he wants an answer like that. I just don't work that way. Um, and another story, Bill Glasson, uh, seven-time winner on tour, a, a good friend of mine, I've worked with him on and off over the years, and the same thing, it's never going to work, never going to work. He invited Bryson to play in a pro scratch uh, last spring uh, at Oak Tree. He called me up, he said he just put on the greatest exhibition I've ever seen in golf. 
And Bill Glassman doesn't say anything nice about anybody, for those of you who know. And so, uh, which was pretty, pretty impressive. And Bill, again, is one of the great ball strikers in the game when he was healthy as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes we do, and that's a great question, because it, it, KBS has been great, because all the shafts have been made for variable length clubs, so now we're trying to get these guys to think out of the box a little bit. Uh, Nunchuck, for example, has a parabolic shaft, and so uh, which what that means is that it doesn't have a regular stiff, extra stiff um, on the band. And so we've tested on flight scope, I had Bryson, a, seven iron, I had a, uh, one of our uh, young ladies, uh, same thing, same length, and the, the club kicked, exact, accelerated through impact exactly the same way. Without a bigger grip. Without a bigger grip, yeah. And we can do without a big, with a bigger grip or without a bigger grip, doesn't, really doesn't matter. So you're working with a major company or not? I can't say that out loud yet. So, yes, yes we are. So. So yeah, it, it's going to be fun. We're we're real excited about the, the possibilities. Um, when we did some work with TaylorMade, uh, TaylorMade kind of snuck in a set. I kind of caught them. I was back at the tour department, kind of walking through, and I noticed there was a set against the wall. I knew it wasn't Bryson's, and they kind of, yeah, we're testing it. We think there's something to this. Uh, could be good for the industry. Thanks. Appreciate. You bet. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. And just again, I don't I don't have all my students play big grips, I have a lot of them that do. Um, one of the reasons why we like the big grip is that we found and we know that grip pressure tends to change through the golf swing. And we found that with the bigger grip that, that subsided quite a bit. Um, grip pressure tended to be lighter. Uh, golf is one of the only sports uh, that's using something, you know, let's say like a tennis racket. You've never seen a small grip on a tennis racket. Ping pong paddle, it's always big. Golf for some reason has a very small handle. And so the problem is, and I think if you even go on tour, you'll see most guys have big grips or built up grips. The problem I've always had, the bigger the grip, it just got mushy, it felt awful. And so, and, and when I say felt, by the way, I usually, I gotta penalize myself a dollar for that, but anyway. And so, um, and so it, it just, the sensation was it was just mushy, it wasn't good. Whereas Jumbo Max, um, the grips are actually pretty good. They feel good, uh, another dollar. Um, the, 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 that's a prototype that's on Bryson's Club right there, and that's an excellent grip, and hopefully that'll be coming out to, by the PGA show. Um, so they've been really supportive, they're great guys, and uh, I'm assuming somebody will probably buy them up. And I, got, I got a question for, again, the group. Who here knows about Jumbo Max? Raise your hand if you know about Jumbo Max. You work with me, so, so few. I gotta say, I went to them, the very first round I played with them, I hit it closer with my irons than I've hit them in 15 years or something. That didn't last, unfortunately. I mean, you know, but they're still pretty good. But by the way, I developed a relationship with the company as well, and they, I bought them by the gross and sold them to my members like wildfire. And it helps older people, especially it's sort of the arthritic grip, they think, but they all can't thank me enough. It definitely takes the shock out of it. And you can make good dough putting them on, too. Yeah. Yes. Um, are they pretty heavy, though? They are, yeah, they're 100, uh, the small is like 105 grams. Are you talking about the grips or the clubs? Yeah, the grips. The grips, yeah, they go from 105 to uh, 120 grams. So if you're into counterbalancing, sometimes that's good too. We've noticed definitely an uptick in club head speed. Just counter, it's, it's, it's also, counter. it's interesting because the bottom of the grip is also quite heavy, so it's almost got weight down here too. It's just a different balance of club. Yeah. I'm not trying to sell clubs or grips. Yeah, and I don't, again, I'm not a swing, I, I, again, I understand swing weight, don't swing weight, I, I have a club repair, I do all that, um, and so, but I'm much more into head weight, how head weight is, uh, is affecting the club, um, not so much, obviously variable length, we, that's why you have to have the swing weights, 
Um, but with a single length, again, it's a, it's a little bit different fitting process. We find that um, women, let's say that, let's say their top speed is 70 miles an hour, we might stop at a seven or a six iron. So they'll have same length, six iron all the way down or seven iron all the way down. And then we go to a hybrid that would be, let's say the next length. And so with 3D printing coming online, a lot of things that are happening, uh, Bryson's actually played around a round of golf with everything 37 and a half. So we hit a driver, we had to jerry rig a driver, it was kind of fun to Is that play. six iron? Six iron, yeah. Standard six Depending iron. Depending on who's, who's, uh, who's manufacturer using it. Um, and so hit the driver, carried it about 260 or so. But again, it's, it was it drivers. We can do a lot in an iron for the same length, but trying to find a driver, that's, uh, that's a whole different story. Yep. Well, the biggest question that he asked was, I have 14 or 13 different swing planes. That was his okay. mindset. So I have to practice each one of those swings or clubs equally. Okay, yeah, I could probably go with that. So I don't have enough time in the day to do that kind of practice. Well, if they were all the same length, then I could just work on one swing. So now in his mind, he's got four swings. So that's really where it came down to. Now the physics end, is understanding the head weight to, to velocity to loft and what that will do to distance. So that's where he loves to think about stuff like that. And just with his ability, obviously his consistency with accuracy is more important than any sort of distance. Yeah. Not losing it. He's very long. He's got uh, his top speed with a driver is 125. Um, I was going to say, talk about the crank Danka. Yeah, it, it took me about two years to get him to hit what we call the crank a day. And, um, and so his stock swing is right around 115 miles an hour. It's very efficient though. Um, we're still at the USAM first hole on the last mat. He hit at 360 and that was his stock swing. We're still trying to figure out, obviously he was jacked up first, first hole. Um, 612 yard uphill, he had basically driver three iron into, which I thought was pretty long. And so, um, uh, but then his crank a dank he's at 125, and I think he can carry it with just about anybody that's out there. And he only does that, he does that maybe three or four times, maybe three times in, in a round. But it's demoralizing, he's been, you know, he's 40 yards or 30 yards by a guy, next thing you know he's 100 yards by a guy. It's like, you should see their faces, it's like, what just happened? Um, and then why are you guys trying to take the term feel out of your talks? Mainly be because we feel feel fails us constantly. And so if we rely and feel on feel, especially in a situation like, let's say, leading or winning the U.S. Amateur and can't breathe, so what do you have to rely on? Well, we constantly went back, rely on what you do. Trust what you do, your mechanics, because that will not fail you. If you're trying to find a set, you couldn't even feel his hands, you know, at that point. So we had to go back to, okay, what do I do? And let's do that. And so we, you know, you watch players all the time. I mean, they're nervous. You can see their breathing habits. Everything changes. And it's important, obviously, to do that and to learn how to breathe in those situations. I've talked to guys that are snipers and how they go through their breathing routines. We go through that. But again, to me, it's a, it's the process. Make sure the process is being done. It doesn't matter the situation of winning a tournament, out of bounds left, water right. All that is all illusions. It's not going to kill you, right? But you're trying to gain a okay. I got to feel something. And so we're trying to get away from that conversation and think of more being committed to the process, doing what we do. So we work on our mechanics. Our mechanics, we can trust those. We know that if we've done it right and we go through the process, pull the trigger, hopefully we'll have a good result. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. Yeah? Uh, you just have to the irons are the same length, and what you said the woods are all different lengths. Yeah, so he's got a driver at uh, 42 and a half, and then he has a driver at 44 and a half. So it depends on where, you know, where he's playing. Three wood he's got three wood at 42 and a half as well. And then he's got a hybrid at, uh, I believe it's 30, 39. We're trying, we're trying. It's just the technology is, it, that's tough. 
The hybrid might be the first thing and the three wood will be the next thing that will be able to get lower because the COR limits, there's no COR limits on those. So that could come pretty fast. So at his, uh, his hybrid head, I think is 240, 250 on the head weight. Uh, normally it's like what, 210, 220? That's so a bit heavier. And he hits that pretty far. Mike, yeah. I think it's worth talking about. You have another player in D2 that was the college player of the year that has yeah. a similar. Yeah, I have. Um, Sorry about all lines. So this is Trevor Clayton. He's been playing golf for about six years. And his club head speeds are right around 125, 126 as well. He's a bomber. Uh, he's shot three competitive 62s. Um, he is the number two uh, in GI and greens and reg in college right now. He wants to be number one. John Ram is uh, number one right now. Um, as, as you can tell, I don't teach every, there are similarities, what, what I do, but he is Bryson's best friend and he picked up golf when he was 14 and he just followed Bryson around like a puppy dog. Whatever Bryson did, he did. Uh, we call him Big Red. Um, he can just, he hits it. He hits it so good. His last two tournaments, college, D1, he's finished 9 under, 9 under respectively. Um, he is uh, coming along. He's a great kid. We're really excited about what he's doing. He just shot 60 last week. Um, at a pretty good golf course. Um, so we're, we're excited about what he's going to be. And I like to show this just to show people that, again, because I don't want to be put in a box. A lot of people in my area tend to put me in a box because it's really funny. Certain kids might want to switch. I, again, I'd love to swing like Bryson. I'm sure a lot of the kids would like to be like Bryson. Why wouldn't you? He's one of the best in the world. And so, uh, but golf pros in our area think we're crazy. And so if you go into my studio, it, it kind of looks like a science project that's really gone wrong in a, in a big way. And so uh, as you can tell, it's an indoor, it's a tent. Uh, we have a nice driving range, great facility. Uh, I didn't want to teach in the sun anymore. And so we, we built this tent, it's about four, uh, 16, 14, 1600 square feet. And uh, has four bays and video in each bay, flight scope in each bay. Um, we have ep bottles, of, uh, we, have, we have water, Epsom salt, we believe in balancing the golf ball. If anybody thinks that the center of gravity is in the middle of the golf ball, they're crazy. We've proven that, uh, that a golf ball, unbalanced golf ball at 20 feet on a straight putt can roll up to 15 inches offline, even though it was a straight putt. So check your golf balls. Um, so we balance all our golf balls. We soak them in Epsom salt. Anybody remember the day Hogan used to do it? Wait. By balancing, you mean you get rid of the ones that aren't balanced? Yes, we go through uh, probably every dozen, probably two to three golf balls are unplayable. You should not play them. You could miss a easily miss a six, seven footer. I'm just saying. Okay, we, we've proven it uh, way too many times. Um, what we do is we put a golf ball in Epsom salt just below water level. It'll tend to go the heavy side will go to the bottom, light side top. And then what we do is we'll put uh, 30 milligrams of lead tape on the golf ball. It flips over, that would be playable. If it doesn't flip over, we've got to put another 30 milligrams of lead tape on it. And if it flips over, 60 milligrams is fine. We'll play that. Anything over 60, it's out. I've had to put 240 milligrams of lead tape on a golf ball to make it flip over. Now, does everybody hit a ball with mud on it? What does it do? Yeah, good luck with that. So. So you're literally, you could be playing a golf ball that is not going to fly straight. Okay, we've, again, we've, pro we, we've proven it. Bryson even went to the tour department, said, am I playing the same golf balls the tour guys are? They said, yes. He said, well, let me show you what I'm doing. And then they said, oh, Bryson, you're not playing the balls that the guys on tour play. So, <laughs> voila, right? So, and then they hand delivered, it was great. It was at Aaron Hills when he did that. And they literally hand delivered him two dozen golf balls. And so we still tested them. I think there were still two or three out of the 24 that were bad that, that we didn't play. And so, and Bryson gives those away, which is always great. You know, give them to a kid, make them hit it bad. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, which is good. So again, but we do this it's just again. So it maybe it does, maybe it doesn't work. We've proven that we know that it can affect you. Uh, you watch a guy on tour; he goes through a ball every two, three, or four holes. 
Next thing you know, you missed the six footer. Was that him or was that the golf ball? Okay. I've not once, uh, maybe once, where I've used the logo, where the heavy side would be directly below that, so it would roll end over end. Usually it's always off center, usually the logo or the, where it'll, the little fine line like the, uh, the, the pro, the X, where it's on top, it's on the seam, it's usually the CG is off from the seam, which is pretty interesting. So it's kind of fun, fun to do. Kids love to do it. They're all, I mean, it's, you know, they, my place is a mess every once in a while, every day. And so, and for some reason, I'm the one there at the end of the day vacuuming and, and so on. Although Bryson now has learned how to vacuum. And uh, so when he's there, he'll get there usually a half hour before me and, and, uh, and vacuum and do his thing and, and keep things nice and clean. So, uh, are we doing, we doing all right? Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Mike, well, you want to talk? Sorry, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, we actually mark the top of the golf ball that's now flayable, and then we'll draw a line. I'm a big believer in a line, you know. Uh, but again, we've done a lot of testing there as well. Uh, don't assume that your players can aim a very fine line on a golf ball. Some would aim, let's say, a, let's say like a range ball that's thicker. They might aim that better. I've had a lot of tour players that just give up sometimes on aiming the fine line because they're perfectionists. And so they just feel like they can't get it. As soon as we give them a wider line, it's like, okay, yeah, that's easy. So test that with your students. It's really good. They get a little wider line and they're more confident or multiple lines. I've got some students who use three lines on a golf ball to aim. And what that does is it just makes the line look wider. So it's easy to target that way. Where do you get the weights to test the ball? Lead tape, just lead tape. I just cut up lead tape. Yeah, it's just very small. I'll send, I'll send you the PDF. Uh, 30 milligrams, which is not very much, by the way. But it can make a big difference. When I got, I had a tailor-made ball and it was 220 milligrams. That was the freakiest thing I've ever, I mean, it was like I had a glob of lead tape on the top of this ball that finally flipped over and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're playing this golf ball. You know, think about if that's off center where that might go. So just once again, it's not our fault. It's our equipment, so, <laughs> right? It's never the tour players' fault. You ever have to hear the tour players say it's their fault? Yeah. yeah. Mike, can you talk to us a little bit about lining up the line? To me, play was slow before. Right. The kids and the adults spending all that extra time lining up their lines and what the better players do finds its way to the 18 handicappers. And I'm like, dude, you could have three-putted by now. Just right. hit the damn thing. Right. And I agree with that. Um, I, did, I do want to go over the USAM because it was funny because they were – saying the slow play, which Bryson's actually fairly fast. Um, it's match play. It's called gamemanship. And so we knew exactly what was going on, when to slow down, when to speed up. Greg Norman was waiting for us every morning, and he said, I don't care what anybody else is saying, you guys keep doing what you're doing. He goes, Seve would have loved what you're doing. He goes, I watched Bryson, he's running. And the next thing I know, he's behind. And then he's kind of in the guy's line, and then he's not in the guy's line. And you can tell, it's all gamemanship. That's all part of it. And so, um, a guy like Paul Dunn, I really appreciate it because he was warned a number of times. And I tell you what, they didn't penalize him, and he's very, very slow. He stuck to his routine the whole time. Um, I think the problem is with the lines. Again, if the lines, something that they have trouble lining up, that's why they end up spending so much time. If I give them a bigger line, they, they do it a lot faster, first and foremost. But again, they've got 30 seconds, that's it, it's over, get out, you know? And so uh, we try, I try very, very hard to make sure it's a quick process. Again, should be in rhythm, should be in time, should be done pretty quick. Uh, I think, again, the problem with kid, and again, they all are gonna follow what the tour players are doing, and everybody lines up a line, right? So the, the, but the problem with that, if you don't practice that, that's why it's gonna take you forever to line it up. So I spend, I throw their putters away and put them in the bag. All right, we're going to just spend an hour practicing how to line up your golf ball. We're going to practice green reading skills. Without, you don't need your putter to do that. Okay. Back to these two kids as far as the golf ball is concerned. When they play their round, how, uh, how long do they need that same ball? Do you switch every hole, every third hole, every 18 holes? Is it 
Every, I would say they're college students. So, you know, a, a Bryson's it comes from, you know, a background where he doesn't have a lot, and so he's going to work that golf ball as long as possible. I try to get him to not do that. Let's get rid of it, you know, every three or four holes. So, right, right, right. I, we're thinking every three or four holes is plenty for golf ball. So, you know, but again, college students, it's, you know, they keep a dozen, they sell a dozen. Right. I mean, that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. How do you charge your students in your stable here? Is it monthly, yearly? Is it something levels? Uh, typically levels, but I charge them monthly. Um, I do have students that come from out of town, uh, from LA, San Francisco, uh, so I charge them differently because they're not there on a daily basis. Uh, so our typical fee is right around 500, 550 bucks a month, but that also includes golf at the golf course as well. So we're fortunate in our area, it's very, very cheap to play golf at a really nice golf course. Where are you at? It's called Dragonfly. Yep, used to be real. Mike, what's, what's this young man's name again? This, this is Trevor Clayton. Played Fresno State. Fresno State, red shirt. Uh, he was at Stanislaus State. Uh, was uh, kind of an interesting story. Uh, we had always planned on moving. He just, he was so new to the game, nobody knew who he was, so he went to a D2 school. Uh, he was going to leave after his second year. Uh, they decided not to release him because they thought that he was Johnny Manziel or something or whatever for <laughs> Manziel. For, uh, for, I couldn't believe they wouldn't release him. So they tried to literally ruin his career. And uh, fortunately, we had a lot of support from Fresno State. Uh, nobody could talk to him because when you're not released, you are in no man's land. And he had to go to a JC, it's called a 424 rule, and it is a very, very difficult process. Um, he was in at Fresno State if he wanted to go to Fresno State, but because of what they did, he couldn't go to Fresno State, had to go to a JC. Um, almost didn't get in Fresno State this year. It, it was uh, a mess. And uh, all because of a, a, an AD who said, I'm gonna teach this kid a lesson. And he's one of the nicest kids you'll ever meet, and he was called every name in the book as he left the school. Uh, to better his career. And when we, when he was getting recruited, we talked about would it be okay if he, after two years, moved on to a D1 school, and they said fine, and they reneged on that as well. So it was a, it was a tough thing, and he's, uh, again, he's one of the great kids. I love him to death, and he, uh, uh, he's having a great spring so far, and I think he's passing his classes. So I think we're good there. Got a couple minutes left. Yeah. Uh, just technique-wise, I notice your players generally have fair emphasis on flat to even bowed wrists, all the way even through to the finish. Is that a, a cornerstone? Yeah, I would say for, for me, uh, I've always believed in the left wrist needs to be flat through impact. We call it, it's a golfing machine term, dual horizontal or full roll, where um, we like to see the left wrist stay flat and in this position as long as possible. And for some reason, um, it seems like most of the kids that do that uh, I used to see Nicholas, you'd see Nicholas with a flat left wrist. I've seen a lot of uh, Bubba where his right wrist is flat for a long period of time. Guys like that tend to really hit the ball a long ways. We just feel, the other thing too, when the wrist is tending to do this, um, I've just seen a lot of injuries there. That's a, that's a very small joint there. We felt like the wrist performed better doing this than this. And so we believe that the arm rotation, it's just a, a good thing to do. Not everybody does it. Um, I have guys that are that are a little more faders, left to right players. I like a left to right if you're tall. Um, he likes to more or less draw the ball and go both ways. Um, and so it just seems to be a strong position and most of my students are, are very, very, very good ball strikers. They hit lots of greens, lots of fairways. I always was told that it's a lot easier from the fairway on the green than it is everywhere else. So that's what we try to do. Time for one more awesome question. Back to uh, these kids, how is their nutrition? They, you know, it took a long time. For Bryson, used to be incredibly nervous before tournaments. He literally would not eat all day. Uh, he now eats probably every two, three bowls. He has a whole a nutritionist as well now. Uh, we're, we've been teaching him how to eat, which has been great. It's hard. These kids don't want to eat. You know, they just they eat maybe a little bit in the morning, and then the, the, and they're playing 36 holes college so they need to eat and trying to get them to eat yeah yeah 
anything. Uh, I know we were with Mark Wahlberg last week, and he's coming out with some stuff that's really cool. Um, and so, and maybe it's cool that Mark Wahlberg's doing it. Maybe they'll eat it, you know, that kind of thing. So as long as it's healthy. So, okay. Mike, thank you very much. Thank that was you. Incredible. <laughs>